concrete bunkers to vast underground railways. Machine guns capable of firing thousands of rounds a minute to precision lasers able to instantly neutralize a threat. Intercept fighters to armor plating. The machinery of war with the ability to attack are almost worthless without the machines that protect. Without defense, there would be no battle, only surrender. This is the story of defense. When flimsy aircraft first appeared above the battlefields of World War I, few could have imagined the influence they would have on the shape of war. In less than 20 years, they went from curiosities to weapons of incredible destructive force. World War II had initiated a new chapter in aerial warfare. And to combat that threat, nations on both sides looked to ways to defend their airspace, in the air and from the ground. Amongst the German arsenal of anti-aircraft weapons were a variety of small caliber light artillery pieces for low-level attacks. For aircraft operating at higher altitudes, it had developed a weapon that became simply known as the 88. A supreme anti-aircraft gun that had two aims. The first was to keep the bombers high rather than letting the bombers come lower and be more accurate. And the second was to kill bombers. There were belts of 88s, both on the approaches to major German cities, but also along the coast, so that the, the Allied bombers had to cross literally bands of heavy and accurate anti-aircraft fire to approach the cities of the Reich to bomb them. The secret of the 88's power lay first of all in its caliber. At 88 millimeters, it was a very large exploding shell fired with a timer that meant it would detonate at a set altitude. But it also had a very long barrel, which gave it a very high muzzle velocity, and with it, the ability to fire a shell to an altitude of more than 7,500 meters well within the target range for most bombers. But what really set the 88 apart was its rate of fire. So instead of having to load the shell and sight the gun each time, the Krupp automatic loading meant that it could fire 15 to 20 shots a minute, which meant that you could literally put up a barrage. So a battery of four guns could put up 80 shells in the course of a minute, which is a wall of steel which the aircraft have to fly through. It's the technical capacity of the German armaments engineers in the 1930s that are actually defending the Reich into the 1940s. Over 20,000 German 88s were produced, including variants and modifications derived from lessons learned in action. The German 88 mm gun is one of the most extraordinary artillery weapons of all time. Every nation developed a heavy anti-aircraft weapon, and none of them were as good as the 88. And the British and the Americans never had a gun to match the 88's capacities. While the 88 may have been a supreme weapon in its time, the development of attacking machines waits for no weapon. The character of war at sea has produced new threats that demand ever more sophisticated means of protection. On the 2nd of April, 1982, Argentine forces mounted amphibious landings off the British colony of the Falkland Islands. The British and the Argentine forces squared off in what was essentially a war at sea. What became immediately obvious to both sides was that in maritime warfare, things had changed. And the key to that change was the introduction of the anti-ship missile. 
History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War, if you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. Ships were incredibly vulnerable to these systems. If you couldn't shoot down the aircraft or you couldn't take out the host ship before the anti-ship missile was launched, you were in a sense helpless. While militaries around the world had known of the dangers of anti-ship missiles, the loss of six British warships during the Falklands conflict offered the first real-world example of their potential destructiveness. What was needed to combat that threat was a last-ditch defense system. And for a last-ditch defense, you need something that's incredibly fast and responsive. A system capable of destroying an inbound missile in flight on the last line. The Phalanx Sea Whiz is such a weapon. The Phalanx is an automated close-in weapon system built around the Vulcan six-barrel Gatling autocannon. In use since the late 1950s on US attack aircraft, the Vulcan fires heavy 20 millimeter shells at the astonishing rate of 4,500 rounds per minute. Housed in an entirely self-contained turreted mounting, the gun is linked to an automated radar fire control system that enables it to automatically seek, detect, track, and engage incoming targets, a task it can perform entirely autonomously. It doesn't require a human in the loop. It will simply pick up the target, fire at it, and destroy it. because it has this enormous rate of fire, it's effective against things like incoming anti-ship missiles, but even large artillery shells. The advantages of an autonomous system are many, but the most significant is in targeting and response times. Taking a human out of the loop means it can react much quicker than a human being could, and it is very, very effective. It doesn't get worried, it doesn't get concerned, it doesn't get tired. If the systems work as we hope that they will someday work, it is potentially more discriminate and more proportional than a human being. Where the Phalanx's autocannon effectively shreds the inbound projectile, the integration of the Phalanx's control system with a commercial grade laser could lead to a different future for air defense weaponry. To the untrained eye, it looks like a telescope. And the operators sitting behind a screen look as though they're playing a video game. But this is no game. Lasers are at last entering military service. And warfare will never be the same. It is the laser weapon system, or laws. The first idea of lasers came from Einstein in 1913. Einstein predicted that we could generate light not with multiple frequencies like in a lamp, but with a single frequency. And we could order light so it could go in the same direction. In theory, laser weapons target an object with a train of brief pulses of high-intensity light energy. The heat generated causes rapid evaporation and expansion of the surface, creating shock waves that damage the object. It's taken over 50 years to make them practical battlefield weapons, overcoming numerous technological hurdles along the way, the biggest being the conversion of energy into the actual beam emitted. Early lasers could only convert 10% of the total power input into light energy, which meant that to create an effective laser weapon, a huge power source was required. Using the latest technology in optics, 
Laws projects an infrared beam from a solid state array that converts 50% of available energy. And when its beam is tuned to high output, it can affect the structural integrity of aircraft, burn holes in the hulls of small boats, heat artillery shells in midair, causing them to explode, or heat storage containers at a fuel dump until the fuel ignites. And tests aboard the USS Ponce in 2014 have proved it works. Among the advantages of a laser, compared to a projectile weapon, is that it requires no projectile. There is no need to manufacture, transport, or store munitions. It is solely reliant on a power source, which makes each shot virtually cost-free. It's much cheaper than a missile, for example. If you fire a missile, it may cost $100,000 or $1 million, and with a laser shot, it can cost like $2 or $1. Lasers may never totally replace other weapons. An international agreement means they can't be used to target individual people. Still, for targeting practically everything else, the time of lasers is finally coming. It's warfare at the speed of light. We may well see near-future wars in which autonomous robot drone swarms are attacking a target and being shot down by lasers. It sounds like science fiction, but it's really happening. Fighter aircraft have always captured the public attention. In World War I, dogfights between biplanes sought to control the skies so that just one side could see the battlefield to direct their artillery. But in World War II, as the skies of Europe and Asia filled with bombers targeting cities, they took on a much more serious role. Anti-aircraft weapons can only do so much in defense of those on the ground. And sometimes, the only way to defend is to take the fight to the skies. On the 16th of July, 1940, Adolf Hitler ordered the preparation of Operation Sea Lion, a potential airborne and amphibious assault on Britain that would come once the Luftwaffe had established air superiority over the UK. And so the famous Battle of Britain began, and standing between the Luftwaffe and victory were two aircraft, one of which was Britain's first monoplane fighter, the Hawker Hurricane an aircraft designed in the mid-1930s. At the time, the whole RAF was still flying biplanes. Around that time, the Messerschmitt 109 came into being, single-engine, stress-skin, monoplane fighter, heavily armed, quite fast, and the RAF said, well, we don't have anything to match it. So they put forward a request to British industry, and the Hawker Hurricane and the Supermarine Spitfire were the initial results of that. The Hawker Hurricane was in many ways a transitional aircraft, constructed using a mix of old and new techniques. A steel tube fuselage was bolted together, over which were fitted wooden stringers that gave the aircraft its streamlined shape. The wing structure was forged of aluminium, but unlike the ME-109, which had a modern aluminium stress skin, the Hurricane was covered in fabric. And that fabric skin would prove to be one of the Hurricane's strengths. The Hurricane was easier to turn around than a Spitfire, particularly battle damage, because more often than not, you just throw a fabric patch over a bullet hole and send it out again. While the Hurricane was an impressive fighter, it could not have won the Battle of Britain alone. The German Messerschmitt 109 was simply too fast. Hurricanes, supreme against incoming bombers, needed to fight alongside an aircraft that could match the capabilities of their Messerschmitt escort. That aircraft is perhaps the best remembered fighter of World War II the Supermarine Spitfire. 
where the hurricane had been something of a compromise between old and new. The Spitfire heralded an all-new method of building fighter aircraft. It was an all-metal design with a monocoque frame and aluminum alloy stress skin covering the outer surfaces, making the Spitfire incredibly light and streamlined, contributing to its legendary maneuverability. It also made it difficult at first to build with the industry required to manufacture and work metal airframes and the particular manufacturing issues surrounding the famous elliptical wing, a complicated design intended to reduce drag and increase aerodynamic performance. That wing proved revolutionary, and along with the Rolls-Royce engines, it gave the Spitfire astounding aerodynamic capability, and perhaps more importantly, speed. The role of the Spitfire was to take on the fighters. When the Germans sent across their Heinkel Triple Ones and Junkers 88s, they were escorted by Messerschmitt 109s and 110s. It was the Spitfire's job to take on those two aircraft to allow the Hurricanes in to take out the bombers. Technically, it had a slight edge on the Messerschmitt, but the contest was close run and often came down to the skill of opposing pilots. The Spitfire may be better remembered than the Hurricane. The two aircraft worked very much together. Without the Hurricane backing up the Spitfires and the Spitfires looking out for the Hurricanes, the Battle of Britain would have ended very differently. When the Spitfire and the Messerschmitt did battle in the skies above Britain, they were among the fastest aircraft of their time. But as the war came to a close, jet engines began to roar. And within less than five years, in the skies over Korea, a new jet aircraft dominated, the technologically advanced MiG-15. Developed in 1947 to intercept bombers, the MiG-15 design drew on valuable lessons learned from World War II. The first thing acknowledged was that it had to be fast enough to intercept targets before they could enter friendly airspace. To achieve this, the Russians copied and improved on British Rolls-Royce jet engines sold to them at the end of the war. The power of the new jet technology was then combined with a new wing design to give it unrivaled speed. Swept wings allow for a similar lift capability but less drag. Instead of trying to push a plank through the air horizontally, if you sweep it, it's easier to move through the air. This combination of two new ideas made for astounding performance gains over earlier aircraft. MiG streaked through the sky at close to 1,100 kilometers per hour. Its rate of climb was 3,000 meters per minute, almost twice as fast as the first generation straight wing jet fighters like the Gloucester Meteors that were sent to combat. And where the MiG also shone was in armament. Fortunately, the plane was delivered to the Air Force combat loaded, so armament tests could be made. The Russians had learned during World War II that aircraft equipped with machine guns simply couldn't inflict sufficient damage to cripple large aircraft. And so the MiG-15s were equipped with one 1.45-inch and two 9-inch cannons. As a result, when MiG-15s began mauling B-29 superfortresses, the effect was as startling to the Americans as it was devastating. The US, which until the MiG's introduction had been able to bomb with impunity, was forced to abandon daylight raids since their bomber escorts, straight-winged F-80 and F-84 fighters, were completely outclassed. 
inland air superiority on the brink of collapse and the Korean Peninsula at risk, the United States deployed the only aircraft which could hope to stop the MiG, the untried F-86 Sabre. The MiG-15, though incredibly capable, was a jet aircraft that had been built in a similar way to aircraft from World War II. Still very much a mechanical airplane, in that all of the control surfaces were operated by wires and pulleys connected to the flight stick. The F-86 Sabre, by contrast, was an all-new aircraft design that attempted to apply the very latest developments in aerodynamics, avionics, and jet engine technology in a single package. It's the first American aeroplane to have full powered flight controls. So the ailerons and elevators are controlled hydraulically via electrical signals and multitude of valves and switches. And it's, it's a very complicated system, but very advanced for its time. The main role of the Sabre was to, to combat the MiG-15s, and they were fairly evenly matched depending on the altitude that the fight took place. At lower altitudes, the MiG was more capable. It was a, a more aerobatic aeroplane at low altitude. Despite the Sabre's disadvantage at low altitude, the two aircraft proved to be fairly evenly matched in performance. The Sabre was slightly quicker, and although it couldn't fly as high, or climb quite as quickly as its Soviet-made opponent. It could dive faster, was more aerodynamically stable, and importantly, it was fitted with the latest radar targeting system that automatically acquired enemy aircraft during high-speed dogfights. A total of 224 Sabres were lost, of which about 100 were the result of aerial combat but they destroyed 566 MiGs, although the disparity between the two was lessened when the MiG was in the hands of an experienced Russian pilot. Regardless, and despite looking outwardly similar, it was the technologically superior Sabres which won the day. And just as agile aircraft are built to attack and defend bombers in the sky, on the sea, fast, high-powered vessels defend convoys and less mobile maritime assets. Although these heavily armed protectors aren't called fighters, they're called destroyers. At the beginning of the 20th century, navies across the world had developed a fascination with torpedoes, which were considered the most feared weapons in maritime warfare. Every navy in the world had a fleet of torpedo boats, and the bigger navies a corresponding fleet of small, fast torpedo boat destroyers. In World War I, the war at sea very quickly evolved in a way that hadn't been expected. German submarines armed with torpedoes posed a constant threat, and a need arose for fast, well-armed vessels to protect the fleet and merchant ships from the menace. Vessels that could operate in heavy seas. In 1916, the British commissioned a design for a much larger torpedo boat destroyer that could fill the role and lead the existing destroyer fleet. The result was the V and W class. The principal characteristic of the early destroyer was speed and the V and W class were an evolution of those designs. Long at 95 meters and narrow with a beam of just nine meters, their compact hull design featured a higher freeboard than previous, which gave them much greater ability in heavy seas. And with a top speed of 34 knots, they were fast and heavily armed. They introduced a number of features, not the least of which was the different arrangement of the guns. Two guns forward, one superimposed above the other, and two guns aft, providing the familiar A and B and X and Y turret configuration, which proved to be very, very successful. Built between 1916 and 1924, 67 of the ships were completed, 
many going on to serve in World War II. It became a style pattern, so to speak, for British destroyer design for the best part of a quarter of a century. But threats evolve, requiring defenses to do the same. The World War I concept of a long line of destroyers steaming at 30 knots heading towards the enemy battle fleet with the torpedo tubes trained over the side to fire torpedoes and sink the battleships is long gone. That's, uh, that's 100 years ago. That's a different style of warfare. In fact, the style of warfare has changed to the point where today there are no battleships and very few battle cruisers, as the most destructive ships of the naval line were once called. Today, that frontline role is undertaken by destroyers. And for the United States, since the late 1980s, that role has been fulfilled by one design. The Arleigh Burke class. Just like the destroyers of old, the Arleigh Burke are long at over 150 meters, narrow, have a shallow draft, and a top speed in excess of 30 knots. But that is where the similarities end. It is a ship which, in many ways, is far more capable than a World War II cruiser. It is able to strike land targets at some distance. It can engage other ships. It can engage aircraft. It is able to control large areas of sea with modern fire control systems, and, and they're a powerful warship. Ships like the Arleigh Burke class are referred to as multi-mission destroyers, taking on the role of both defender and attacker. With Tomahawk cruise missiles for attacks on land-based targets, Harpoon anti-ship missiles, acoustic homing torpedoes for anti-submarine duties, a suite of short, medium, and long-range missiles designed to intercept enemy ballistic missiles at any stage of their trajectory, and the latest surface-to-air weapons. The Arleigh Burke class is an incredibly capable weapons platform with a level of firepower that crews of the V and W class destroyer would have found unimaginable. But the capacity to attack is nothing without the ability to defend. The Arleigh Burks incorporate elements of stealth design in the angled hull and the tripod mainmast, which make them more difficult to detect by anti-ship missiles. This is combined with the latest air and missile defense systems that can detect a golf ball-sized target as far out as 166 kilometers, giving it ample time to engage countermeasures. Should something get through, a suite of close-in weapons, including the Phalanx Sea Whiz, stand guard on deck. And an air filtration system makes the Arleigh Burks the first US warships designed to endure in the event of a nuclear, biological, or chemical war. If the Arleigh Burke class is the ultimate expression of the old adage, the best form of defense is attack, then land-based defensive structures would represent the directly opposing view one that implies that the best form of defense is attrition. With the weaponry of the 20th century evolving at a rate that in many ways outpaced tactics, and with mechanization increasing the speed of battlefield advances in World War II, nations turn to the age-old strategy of permanent or temporary structures designed to slow an enemy and defend positions. Structures that in World War I had resulted in utter carnage. The last line of German defense in World War I was a 160-kilometer stretch of concrete bunkers and pillboxes in front of which stretched tracks of barbed wire that were at times 91 meters deep. It was called the Hindenburg Line. Under intense pressure, the Hindenburg Line had failed. But it had provided enough resistance to encourage the French, alarmed at the possibility of renewed German aggression, 
to build their own defensive wall in 1930. The Maginot Line. Obviously, the French knew, especially from World War I, that you need a defensive position, a defensive posture. So the Maginot Line was a series of interconnecting pillboxes. You had tank ditches, you had physical obstacles in the way to try and deter somebody from, from coming through. The Maginot Line was not a single continuous structure. Instead, it was composed of over 500 separate buildings, each arranged according to a detailed plan. The key units were 50 large forts, or ouvrages, which were located within 14 kilometers of each other along the borders with Germany and Italy. These forts were often connected using reinforced underground tunnels and were placed near enough to each other to provide interlocking fields of fire. The surface areas of these vast bases were protected by steel reinforced concrete, which was up to three and a half meters thick. A depth capable of withstanding multiple direct hits from the largest artillery. They were fitted with steel turrets, domes that nestled on the ground when under attack, and elevated for firing. In theory, the Maginot Line was capable of creating a massive continuous line of fire that should have devastated any attack. However, it had one major failure. It was not mobile and warfare had changed. Mobility had caught up with firepower. And when in May 1940, the German army attacked through Belgium, as it had in World War I, and crossed the supposedly impenetrable forests in the Ardennes, the closest the thousands of French soldiers manning the Maginot Line came to seeing action was watching unchallenged waves of German bombers flying over it. In 1942, there was only one way to attack Europe en masse, and that was by sea. And with Germany in almost total control of the continent, Hitler decided to keep it that way. With a workforce of close to a million, the Germans began construction on what would be the largest network of fortresses built in the 20th century, the Atlantic Wall. A formidable collection of an estimated 15,000 reinforced concrete bunkers stretching across the Belgian and French coasts from the Norwegian to the Spanish border. The Atlantic Wall consumed more than a million tons of steel and 17 million cubic meters of concrete. In all, there were 70 batteries along the Danish coastline, with 293 large caliber guns, 225 batteries in Norway, with over 1,000, and 343 batteries along the French coast, which included 1,348 heavy weapons and an assortment of anti-tank and anti-aircraft positions, machine gun posts, munition storage areas, and bunkers housing supplies and power generation equipment. The Atlantic Wall was the first line of Fortress Europa, as Hitler called it. And the 630-kilometer West Wall, or as it was better known, the Siegfried Line, the last. Built between 1938 and 1940, the Siegfried Line incorporated more than 18,000 bunkers, pillboxes, and tunnels stretching along the French border from the Netherlands to Switzerland. Designed to slow an offensive while reserves are brought up, the Germans knew the speed of tanks posed the greatest threat. And so a vast network of tank traps were central to the line's design. So generally, you've got to have a trench that's wide enough to trap the tanks where they are so they can't uh, break through. Then you've got tetrahedrons, so big concrete triangles. 
so tanks can't climb over them basically because if they do they get stuck on the point and lose uh, lose traction and like the barbed wire of world war one that was often laid to funnel troops to their death the tank traps were designed to lure tanks to their destruction But defensive walls can be breached with enough concentrated manpower in one location. And once breached, they can't be moved. The Atlantic Wall was pierced when 156,000 Allied troops landed on the beaches at Normandy. And thousands of ships and aircraft threw their might into General Eisenhower's Great Crusade. It marked the beginning of the end of Fortress Europa. And like the barbed wire of World War I, the Hindenburg Line and the Atlantic Wall before it, the Siegfried Line offered some respite to retreating German troops, but eventually buckled under the weight of the Allied advance. Like its predecessors, it fell victim to the mobility of modern warfare and was overrun in early 1945. And with it, the Third Reich fell. If the enduring image of the First World War is a misery of wire and mud, it was partly made so by a revolution in armaments. Trenches and barbed wire will slow in advance, but waves of men can only be completely stopped by firepower. Hiram Maxim was a man of great curiosity, an inventor of a diverse range of items. One of his creations would make him a wealthy man and change the course of history. The story goes that Maxim was talking with a friend in Europe who told him to forget his chemistry and electricity. If you want to make a pot of money, invent something that will enable these Europeans to cut each other's throats with greater facility. And then he had a chance experience. So the story went that Maxim fired the M1903 Springfield rifle and was struck, literally, by the recoil. And it occurred to him that he could harness that power. Maxim designed a system that took the force of the gun's recoil to operate it automatically by simply using the explosive energy from the firing of a projectile that would otherwise go into a rifleman's shoulder and have it drive the working parts backwards. Maxim conceived the idea of what we now know to be the machine gun. Later, Maxim's company was bought by the Vickers Company, which was a major British armaments company. Vickers made some modifications to the design to make it more efficient and in 1912 produced what we know as the Vickers machine gun. What they produced was a weapon that could continuously fire an extraordinary 450 rounds per minute, but that rapid firing generated extreme levels of heat. One of the really distinctive features of the Maxim series of guns, others as well, is the big blocky barrel section, if you like. Well, the barrel is actually very slip, and the barrel sits inside what is actually a water jacket. The jacket around the main barrel contained 3.7 litres of water that had to be kept up to the weapon to ensure that it didn't overheat. In the stalemate that was the Western Front, it was the perfect defensive weapon. Where you've got a fixed machine gun and you're able to dominate the landscape in front of you. The classic movie image of swinging back and forth this, this weapon that's utterly devastating. The Devil's Paintbrush is one of the nicknames for, for Maxim's gun later on. The Vickers machine gun was such an efficient design, it remained in service in some fashion until the 1960s. But the need for a constant water supply meant it took as many as six men to operate it. With increasingly mobile attacking forces, unreinforced static defense placements quickly became tactically obsolete. Modern warfare demanded defensive mobility to meet an attacker anywhere 
on fronts of increasing scope. The Vickers, with its water cooling system, simply couldn't keep pace. When Hiram Maxim invented his automatic machine gun, it replaced another weapon that had gained only modest favor amongst the militaries of the late 1800s, the Gatling gun. This is um, not, a, not a machine gun that, as we would describe it today, um, but we would call it a manually operated machine gun with a rotating cluster of barrels and some sort of feed device for the ammunition sitting on top. It's a, a machine, an engine that fires more than one shot, in this case by turning a crank. Gatling's 1862 invention had failed to capture the hearts of the army in its day. But when modern electronics and hydraulics were applied to replace the manual crank handle, and it was given modern armor-piercing rounds, it became the ultimate expression of the original, a seven-barrel machine cannon of devastating power. Like so many modern weapons, the GAU-8 was designed in 1970 with a particular Cold War what-if scenario in mind. In this case, it was what if the Soviet tank forces just happened to come over the horizon? The Americans decided they would need a fast, highly mobile anti-tank weapon to defend against the possibility. And when the GAU-8 was found to be effective against heavy armor, it was given its own high-speed delivery mechanism. The Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt II, commonly referred to as the Warthog. These things would scream in overhead and just destroy the armor, limiting the need to engage them tank to tank or to use anti-tank weapons, infantry anti-tank weapons. In practice, of course, the Cold War did not go hot. As an anti-tank tool, it kind of fell by the wayside. And the GAU-8, along with the Warthog, might have passed into the footnotes of history, like the Gatling gun, had it not been for the Gulf War, where it was used against Iraqi armor with devastating effect. Very quickly, it was realized it could be an immensely capable close air support platform. Not only will it penetrate tremendous amounts of armor or cover or anything you put in front of it, the energy being put forth by this is just so tremendous. The Avenger has an astronomical maximum firing rate of up to 4,200 rounds per minute. That's roughly 70 rounds a second. And its armor-piercing rounds are lethal. So it's projecting these huge 30 millimeter in diameter shells, which are about yay long, and contain an immense amount of explosive potential. Everyone who's been in service anywhere near it loves the thing and anyone who's faced it, I imagine, has, has feared it. The GAU-8 Avenger is the pinnacle in the development of the machine gun. A line drawn from the defensive trench emplacements of World War I to close air support actions. And like all machines of war, they continue to adapt and evolve. The most fragile piece of equipment on any battlefield is the soldier. And for centuries, militaries have sought ways of protecting that asset. Body armor is nothing new. We are all familiar with the suits of armor worn by the Knights of the Middle Ages. In the 20th century, the idea of offering protection to the enlisted man began with the issuing of simple steel helmets in World War I but there's only so much you can get under a steel helmet. In World War II, air war resulted in huge losses of aircrew, who were quite literally sitting ducks for anti-aircraft fire. From a growing need to defend the undefended came the genesis of what we now call the bulletproof vest. There was something called a flak jacket, and that was kind of the original name for a bulletproof vest. Air crew used to wear these nylon vests which had these little two-inch steel plates which were interwoven and they would provide protection, as the name implies, 
from the flak, from the fragments from anti-aircraft munitions. But they were bulky and extremely heavy. A problem solved in the early 70s with the discovery of Kevlar, a lightweight polymer five times stronger by weight than steel. Over time, ballistic protection that was being offered to troops was getting better and better. And at the same time, the burden to troops was becoming less. So the vests themselves were getting lighter. More protection, less weight. And as that evolution has continued, the bulletproof vest has been renamed. The Improved Outer Tactical Vest, or IOTV, is the very latest in troop protection. A medium-sized IOTV weighs 1.6 kilograms, down from 10 kilograms for a World War II flag jacket. Fully equipped, it has soft armor panel inserts, four silicon carbide ballistic plate inserts, front, side, and rear, and collar and groin protectors. It is also designed with quick release and medical access features. If the, the soldier gets into a very difficult spot, like underwater, then the individual can very quickly release the armor packs, and that gives them more mobility. Mobile, light, and strong. A fully equipped modern vest can withstand a 3006 Springfield M2 armor piercing round at normal range. But body armor is designed for a very specific task. Disposing of bombs and the increasing use of IEDs calls for protection that is quite different from taking an impact from a bullet. Most people wearing bulletproof vests in combat will probably be shot at from some distance, with a projectile optimized in shape to penetrate materials, a known threat. This is not the case for individuals attempting to disarm an improvised explosive device, a landmine, or an unexploded warhead. Up close and personal, the soldier will potentially be exposed to fragments traveling at incredibly high velocity, possibly even 12,000 to 15,000 meters per second as they're accelerated by the explosion. But that threat can be countered by the advanced bomb suit. With a bomb suit, you've got to deal with a much more intense threat. It's of paramount importance to use thick materials that are able to deal with the loading that you get from an explosive blast. In the aftermath of the London Blitz, bomb disposal teams worked largely unprotected when neutralizing unexploded ordnance. In the decades since, suits have evolved to become sophisticated pieces of military equipment designed to withstand extreme force while allowing the wearer clear vision and mobility. Bomb suit is generally made from multiple materials. So we would use high strength steels or ceramics to deal with the fragments that you would get from an exploding munition or an exploding IED. And we use high performance fibers such as Kevlar and we use heat resistant fibers as well. So fibers that are able to deal with the heat of an explosion. All of these materials combined can offer protection from the shrapnel of the explosion. But it does little to defend against the shock of the blast. So we use foam, and what the foam does, it mitigates the shock that you get from the explosive blast as it transmits from the bomb suit to the human body. And that increases the level of survivability for the occupant. Every battle is an arm wrestle an examination conducted by an attack on a defense. And the history of war is the story of the evolution and adaptation of offensive and defensive tactics and the machines used to fight them. The IED has changed the nature of warfare, and tactics and equipment have evolved to defend against it, just as they have in every aspect of warfare. And 
they will continue to do so.